All right, guys, we're back with Defend the Take, the greatest game show on the side of the internet where you get to defend takes you may or may not believe. And today we have Dave DeFore, as always, and we got our special guest, Mike Borkanov, who, if I remember correctly, last defeated Dave DeFore by a score of zero to negative three for the first time. I have negative three points. Yes, you, you get negative three points. <laughs> You're getting another negative point, Dave. I'm happy to be back. I'm undefeated. I'm undefeated. I've got it all. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mike, I'm, I'm just hoping for one point out of you, though, because you still haven't racked up a point, I think. That's right. Hasn't even scored a point and got a victory. That's, you know, that's like you know what matters traded. most? That's like getting traded midseason and then going to collect a championship ring, like if your team won without you. Cheap. Yeah. Talk all you want, Dave, but you know what matters most? The zero in my L column. That's true. That is true. That's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, but speaking of trades today, guys, we are doing Defend the Take Trade Edition. And uh, we're going to be talking about three topics today. Um, the way the show works, as always, is you guys will each get 60 seconds to present your side of the take. And after those 60 seconds, we will discuss and you guys will try to convince me why you are correct. And the three takes today that we will be discussing are actually three trade candidates or actually two candidates and one person who's already been trading uh but the first person we will be talking about is pascal siakam who was just traded to the indiana pacers uh the second person will be andrew wiggins and the third person will be zach levine you guys will present your favorite uh team that you would like to trade for these players and i will basically choose which one of you guys is correct uh, but for the first take since pascal siakam has just been traded uh, to the Indiana Pacers for three first round picks, Bruce Brown, Jordan Nora, and then the Pelicans are also in there sending Kira Lewis Jr. to Toronto. Uh, since this trade has been completed, I'm going to make you guys defend one of the major components of this trade, defending a team there. And Mike, since you are the guest, which team would you like to defend? I, I think I'm going to go with the Pacers, the recipients here. Okay, and that means Dave gets the Raptors, and Mike, since you're the guest, I'm going to let you go first, but your 60 seconds to defend the Indiana Pacers part of this trade starts now. Look, the case for the Pacers is easy. They're an up-and-coming team. They already got one great point guard. What do they need? Length on the wing. They need a little bit more scoring, and they needed a guy who can defend across a few positions. Pascal Siakam, welcome to Indianapolis. A perfect fit. He's going to gel so well on that team alongside Miles Turner. They still got talent. They kept Benedict Matherin, right? That's pretty big. They immediately get better this year. He's only going to be 30 next year, so they get to re-sign him. We'll see what the contract looks like. I assume trading away three picks, you're going to keep him for a while. I don't think it necessarily means you're giving him like the 30% max deal. So let's not assume that right now. And also, what do they trade away? Like, a what, maybe the 20th pick in the draft this year and then whatever becomes the worst of that you know five team slog of trade protections that they have on the other pick okay and then a 2026 pick by then if everything goes to plan for indianapolis that should be outside the lottery too i think that's worth it for a time, guy time. dave your one minute begins now you know one of the follies of doing these sort of trade grades or trying to figure out who won the trade is that the context of the actual team mission and the building process is thrown out the window and that's why i think it's better if you wait a while and, and you can take in the aggregate moves in this particular instance though i think you can just look at the last two moves and color this as one big move for the Toronto Raptors. I'm talking about moving OG Ananobi and moving Pascal Siakam. The haul that they've gotten from those two players, Emmanuel Quickly, RJ Barrett, Bruce Brown, who a contender would happily pick up, uh, and they should easily be able to flip him for another asset, at least a first round pick. They picked up Jordan Nwara, Kira Lewis, a couple of guys that are gonna be into the bench, three first round picks and a second. That's a, quite a haul for two players that were on their way out. These are expiring deals. They needed to move them anyway. And we've been hammering Masai for not doing this in the past. So I think that both of these trades, when taken together especially, time, fantastic time. moves. Uh, to start this dis discussion, I'm going to present a question to both of you guys. But um, if the Pacers win a single championship with Pascal Siakam in the next three, four years, do the Pacers automatically just win this trade? 
Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes. <laughs> That's what I mean, right? So you have to take into consideration, like, what does it look like? What is the what does the contract look like? If it is a 30% max, do we revisit this trade and say, wow, uh, Indiana gave up a lot? I think you probably do. Like three firsts and, and Bruce Brown, who is, again, a piece that a contender is going to give assets for this season because he can he can help you win a title now um so yeah I, I do think that the the contract will matter even signing him to the contract is not guaranteed although mike i'm assuming we both feel the same way you know <laughs> don't worry we got you pascal i think there was lots of winking and nudging on the trade calls going on you know uh, look, I don't even know if you need to win a title for this trade to be a success for the Pacers. Obviously, you get, like you want to win a title, but like, what if you get to the Eastern Conference Finals with Pascal Siakam over the next five years? What if you Nothing keep making the playoffs? Good. Yeah, there's something yeah. set to be like to be really good, and Indiana like has a history of just being really, really good, and they want to get back to that. And you know, it's I, I think it's a nice fit. Like Pascal Siakam is a good player. We got yeah. lost in the like delirium of trade season for the last year or whatever since he's been on you know the market but like this guy's made all nba he's a really good like rangy type of three four forward he can do stuff defensively and offensively and that's worth a lot maybe they'll give him the max maybe they don't give him the max like we'll see i don't know how this all goes but like it's nice for a team who's on the ascent, by the way, with a very clean cap sheet. And this matters, right? The fact that Indiana has a very clean cap sheet as opposed to like the Lakers making that kind of signing, who adds a really good player who's still in his prime or maybe just on the tippy toes, uh, the tippy toes of like leaving it. And you add him to everyone else who's young and good and getting better. Take a little bit of the burden off of Tyrese Halliburton. You get by trading for him now, one extra playoff run. Right. Like that, that kind of matters too. I, they could have probably signed him in the off season and, and probably to the same deal. He'd be, you know, well, I mean, but getting this, right now, they now. Get his bird rights though. So they can, and they get his bird rights. Things, right. Yeah. No, this yeah, is a yeah. great trade. It's a great trade for Indiana. And, and I mean, just like the OG trade was a great trade for New York. As a matter of fact, if I'm another team out there, I'm kicking the tires on a Bruce Brown trade just because I feel like Toronto operates kind of like, in my favor as well. Like a win-win trade is good for everybody. And when you look at the Raptors side of this, there's so much more clarity in uh, just the vision of what they're doing right now. This is clearly a rebuilding team. It's going to be built around Scotty Barnes and Emmanuel quickly. RJ Barrett who is just a monster in transition. You can see how he fits so well with what they're doing. And now they've just, they've cleared the decks. And there's so much freedom there from, from an organizational standpoint. You can actually set new goals. You can, you know, you've cleared out all of the old regime and, and which is sad in a lot of ways, but can, can be refreshing as well because you start the process of being good instead of being sub mediocre, which is what Toronto is right now. So, I mean, this is, it, it really is a trade that worked out very well for everybody. And, and even if Pascal, I mean, we know the, the level of player he is. This is a two-time all NBA player. If he's just playing at his normal level, it's a huge win for Indiana, who, by the way, look at their record the in trades the last year and a half. I mean, they've really knocked it out of the park and signing Bruce Brown turned into a big trade. So this is just kind of high level team building that we're watching. I would say the only thing that I, I, pro I like this for Toronto, like the picks on the whole aren't the greatest. Like, so you're not saying it's a slam dunk type of trade. I, I think my small little nitpick is the fact that Two of these picks are coming up in this draft, which isn't expected to be a good draft. And it means you're kind of, uh, you know, getting them all at once, so to speak. I'm sure they'll try to move that pick, uh, one of those two picks, into the future so they have some more flexibility. And I'm sure they'll try to trade Bruce Brown, who either, you know, they can not pick up the team option for, uh, or they can try to trade and uh, and move him somewhere else. But again, like, you, you probably want a little more future flexibility with the draft picks instead of trying to have them all at once. But we'll see. Nonetheless, like Indiana still gets to keep a lot of its picks too, right? Like yeah. it's cupboard is still pretty, pretty full if you're moving forward since one of those picks wasn't theirs. And the other one is top four protected in 2026, which is like, a, you know, just in case something goes really, really bad type of situation. Right. So I, I think that it, it leaves them in a good spot asset wise. Yeah. And I will say having multiple draft picks in what is considered a down draft, but a very good role player draft 
this is not a bad thing for an organization like the Raptors that's drafted pretty well. So, you know, being able to maybe trade down uh, packaging picks and trade up when you see a guy that's in an optimal range, let's say for, for a contract situation, if you've got a guy that you can trade up into the twenties for, let's say, but you've got him on your draft board as a lottery pick. I mean, having those extra picks right then and there, it's like having cash. You know, you ever gone and bought a used car? I'm asking $5,000 for it. Well, hey man, look, I brought 4,500 in cash. Will you take it? Yeah, sure. Why not? And I think having those, the, the, the ability to use those assets is just uh, going to be important, especially for a team like Toronto that does draft pretty well. So I have, now, a, question, I have a question about the Pacers actually. Um, they're currently the sixth seed. They're one game behind the four seed and they're five games behind the Bucks, who are the two seed with Siakam. Where do they finish the season? Well, I think first of all, what has to, what cannot be ignored is that by getting Siakam, they get a little more defense against missing the top six seeds, right? Like that's very important now. Like being in that top six is extremely important, right? Um, by bringing Siakam in, that's a little more help to make sure that they avoid the play-in tournament, right? That's kind of self-defense there. I think probably some, I, I would guess like they get into that four or five mix. Um, they end up somewhere there. It depends how the Knicks do. Obviously they play pretty well after trading for OG and an OB. Um, we'll see how much the heat try to invest in the regular season, uh, that annual conundrum, right? Maybe someone gets hurt from one of those top three seeds and, and they have a slide, but I think they'll figure in, in that four or five mix because the regular season is so important to them, right? They're doing this for the first time when Tyrese Halliburton comes back healthy, um, they'll be able to make a push again. And maybe by getting Siakam and giving him a few games to acclimate, you can hold Hal Burton back a little bit, make sure his hamstring is like all, all the way back uh, before you bring him back. And so we'll see. But I think it's important that they now get to invest in themselves, try to make another case to be a top six team and get that playoff run with Siakam before the extension, whenever that happens. If you guys have to put money on it, do you think Tyrese and Pascal win a championship for the Pacers at some point? No. I mean, I, I kind of agree. Like, if I always have to bet on that question, no matter the team, I will always bet no. Uh, like, the odds are just too stark. Uh, but also, yeah, I mean, I, listen, I love Tyrese Halliburton. I feel like I was one of the first uh, believers, uh, you know, in Tyrese Halliburton and in that talent and just like what the Pacers got, but... Um, you know, he's not like a definitive top five player. Pascal Siakam is good. And just like winning a title is too damn hard. Like that's really what it comes down to is just winning a title is too damn hard. So I always bet on the no to that question. Maybe that hurts me, but maybe the argument helps me. If we weren't in the like prime years of Giannis, Jokic and Embiid, you know, I mean, you just can't open the doors for anyone else right now. And that doesn't even mention guys who I think are on the cusp, like Luca and, and Shea Gojas Alexander. Jason Tatum is like right behind there on probably maybe even Chet the Holmgren. best team of his run. Yeah, Chet. I mean, well, come on. Um, <laughs> pump the brakes there. Uh, but but you know, it, it's uh it, it's incredibly hard to win a title. And I I do think like there's there's going to be a point where Tyrese Halliburton's defense is going to cost them high leverage game. I mean, like huge games. He is going to be picked on. We're going to see it in this year's playoffs. Uh, Cause I do think that they're going to be a top six team uh, now, especially with Pascal Siakam. I mean, he just, he fits perfectly for what they're doing. Uh, but I do think we're going to see Halliburton. Uh, we're going to see him put through the blender quite, quite a bit. And, and that limits your ceiling. Like, I mean, unless you've got guys who can pick it up, Pascal sort of that guy, I do like Miles Turner behind him, but I, I think that they would need another defender. Um, and they just lost Bruce Brown. So, yeah, I, I don't see a title for them. I don't know. Maybe, maybe like uh, this iteration of that team. I, I just don't think it's going to be that good, but they could maybe have home court in the playoffs next year. Can I add one thing we haven't gotten to yet, which is, I think, kind of a vital part of this whole discussion? The Pacers didn't trade Ben Mather. Like, that's kind of important, sure. right? Like, this guy was pretty good as a rookie. And he's their lottery ticket, so to speak. Like both, yes, he was a lottery pick. But like if they're trying to find an accomplice for Hal Burton in the backcourt and get a big talent, they already have one in-house, right? And I'm sure that the Raptors asked for him and tried to push to for get sure. him in the trade. 
But like retaining that young talent is so valuable for the Pacers. One, because if you're going to be a team who's picking later in the draft in the second half of the first round, maybe in the twenties, whatever it is, you want to be able to uh, acquire a high level talent like Matherin also because he's going to have to step into a bigger role now with Bruce Brown being traded. Right. Cause only kind of that combo guard type of uh, type of dude in the rotation. And, and finally, like he's cost controlled for the next few years. And, and that yeah. matters as they add what is likely to be a, a very big salary to their cap sheet. I'm sure that Toronto did ask for him uh, because I believe that they are legally obligated to try to collect all players born in Canada. I actually think that's written into the Canadian constitution mm-hmm. uh, for the Toronto Raptors. And, and yeah, if he can be there, Keegan Murray. Wow. You know, but I like Buddy Hield for them. I mean, like this is a good team. They just need some guys who can defend, and, and Matherin's not that. So I, I'm, I'm maybe lower on Matherin than you are, but I like him. I mean, I think hanging on to your assets is better than getting rid of them for nothing. So I mean, it's again, man, like Toronto is just out here doing good deals with teams where everybody wins. It's it's pretty nice. Dave, I'm gonna ask one final question before I give my judgment, but Dave, M- Mike already said that. Even if the Pacers don't win a championship, they could still win this trade. Do you agree, Dave? Or do they have to win a championship with Pascal for them to win this trade? Yeah, I think, again, man, I think if you're just very good and you have years of extended success, that's good enough. I, I don't, I'm not a rings guy. I mean, I, I think that being good is fine. And look, man, the mall business isn't doing well. Indiana Pacers need to be good. Like, this is not like, this isn't somebody's hobby. This is, this guy needs to make some money here. So they need to be good. They need to sell tickets. Let's, you know, I I think that, and this trade helps them do that. They should be a safe playoff bet. Top six for the next three or four years. I mean, and maybe they're that with just Halliburton, but Pascal puts them there. I think gives them a chance to knock on the door for some home court advantage uh, in the playoffs. Well, since both of you guys said this is a win-win trade, I'm going to give both of you guys a point. Wow, oh, your first point, Mike. First, first point for Mike. You never forget your first. <laughs> it really is. It really is a win-win. I mean, this is just good business. Good business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, moving on to our second take. The second player that we will be trading is Andrew Wiggins of the Golden State Warriors. Uh, Mike, you're on the clock. I was hoping to go second so I could blow oh, well, Dave's mind. If you want, go ahead because I have the perfect right. spot for him. Okay. No, I mean it. It can't be better than mine. I have a one-for-one trade. It's swapping problems. Let's go Andrew Wiggins to the Utah Jazz for John Collins. Listen, man, I I just think the Warriors, they need a big who can shoot. John Collins at least will shoot. I don't know if he can make. And the the Utah Jazz need a wing. And it opens up space for Lowry to play more at the four. So, I mean, this is just a win-win. It gets Wiggins to a place where, you know, he won't have the media scrutiny that he has in Golden State. and, And he'll play for a really good coach in Will Hardy. Uh, and he fits really well for what that team is doing right now. I mean, I, I think that he helps them get into the play-in. John Collins obviously just adds some size to the Warriors, which they are one of the smallest teams in the league. So uh, I think that this is a win-win. The salaries work exactly. You don't need to add any picks. Don't add any any you know trade fodder down at the end of your bench. Just swap them. Let, maybe they can trade houses. Just make it easy, like one for one. It's so easy. Just leave your cars time, time, where time. they are. Just swap people. It's fine. All right, Mike, who are you trading Andrew Wiggins to? Are you ready for it? Andrew Wiggins, he's coming home. He's coming home to the place that he should have known, Cleveland. <laughs> All right, he's going to go to Cleveland. He's going to get traded for Karis LeVert and Isaac Okoro, also a near like exact trade uh, financially for one another. Cleveland is still trying to fill that wing, that big wing hole. They still need help, right? Karis LeVert, not quite it. Isaac Okoro, definitely not it. Max Struess, ah, it's just not working. The minivans had some problems, like it's just not going there. Andrew Wiggins, he's got title uh, on his resume. He's got that championship DNA. You know, maybe they can revise him a little bit, uh, revitalize him a little bit, put him into that lineup. Maybe this is the guy that can plug that big hole for them. And for Golden State, all I'm saying is it makes their cap sheet so much easier (laughs) going forward. Like they're obviously in the the timeline where they're just trying to make 
Uh, less of a luxury Fine. tax burden for themselves. <laughs> I, my, I love uh, that this is just salary dump for, for Golden State. I, you know I, what's funny is... Wait, wait, wait hold up. I, it's I, not just salary dump. I know, I know. When you were saying he's going home, I thought for sure you were going to send him to Toronto. I'm like, oh, oh they're going to take another Canadian guy? <laughs> nope, nope. 2014 no, number one overall pick. I, I, I say this. I, like, Wiggins is theoretically great for them, but he's so low energy now. That you just he wouldn't he wouldn't help him and, and then for the Warriors like Karis LeVert and Isaac Okoro aren't as good as Wiggins at like Karis LeVert only scores and I think Wiggins is better and Isaac Okoro only defends and I think Wiggins is still better so like I mean this is good if you're the Warriors and you want to tank but I don't think they want to tank they don't want to waste a season whereas if you get John Collins maybe John Collins has the most wide open shots of his life. Because he's playing with Steph Curry and do and pick and pop with Steph Curry and John Collins, buddy. That's a wide open eight foot away from the defender three point jumper every time you run it. I mean, John Collins is a pretty smart player. He also adds a little bit of rim protection, which they just do not have outside of Andrew Wiggins, actually. So, I mean, to me, this is now your yours is funny because sending him to Cleveland is hilarious. Mine is actually like this works for everybody. No, I know. Not to hate I'm, on your trade because I like it. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not here to disagree with you. I like the John Collins trade. I've liked John Collins for a while. I see it. I actually don't think that this is just a salary dump. Like, yes, getting him long term off the books helps Golden State. Like we've seen it since last summer that they're they're trying to think far afield and Joe Lacob is a little tired of cutting all these checks. But if you remember back about 20 years ago when another Bay Area team had to make a trade to save the coach from himself by sending, uh, what was it, Eric Pena away, Michael Pena away, Jeremy Pena, whoever that first baseman was, so Scott Hatterberg could play. The Warriors got to play Kuminga, right? Like, this opens up the space for him to play for Moody in the in the rotation by sending Andrew Wiggins out. Steve Kerr doesn't have a choice anymore. He can't just rest on the guys, uh, rely on the guys that have won a title for him, and he has to play the young guys in the situation not to mention that Kuminga is just better right now. Like he's been playing better this season. This is the internal like strife for the Warriors that they can't quite get all the way there and rely on the young guys. Chris Paul is unreliable because of his age and his injury history. You get a guy off the bench in Karis LeVert uh, who can add a little bit of pop when they need it. And Isaac Okoro, I don't know. You just take a flyer on him. Maybe you you put your your special Warriors magic, sprinkle it on him and see if he can hit a three every once in a while. He's going to be I, playing the five. Within I mean, a, a week, he could play the six. Steve I don't know, Carter. like whatever. Take your chances. Isaac Okoro is gonna be playing center for you know <laughs> half the games. I mean, it's just I, look. And, and the other thing is that the Warriors need size, man, and and they don't need like they don't need another wing that doesn't have a, an identifiable role come playoff time. They don't need that. Like they need. But Andrew Wiggins is not playing well right now. I know he's he got stinks. a role that he's not doing he well. What does that yeah. get you? I well again, I this is where I, I think Kuminga is more of the answer there on the wing, and you need a big guy, period. Looney has fallen off a cliff, which by the way, makes been me sad. getting a pass. He fell off a cliff on defense, too, right? Like he's less effective offensively, but fell off a cliff. And they need a guy who can just go out there and be productive, even in his minutes at the five. And I think John Collins is the best option that you got, and probably the most gettable, too. Yeah, but yeah, there's a reason John Collins keeps getting traded or almost traded or perpetually almost He's traded. He's been on the like, trade block since he signed his first extension. Right, exactly. Even before then, they were like, ah, oh, we well, want to trade him. Just, nah, we'll give right, him $125 this because, million. This is because money is evil, man. That's, <laughs> this is, that's what it is. <laughs> we'll, we'll do our takes on capitalism a little later. Yeah, we'll, I'm just saying, yeah. like, I, I think this trade can help the Warriors. Uh, I, they do need a big, but, you know, like, this gets them something else. They're not going to get, a, I think, a high impact big if they're trading Andrew Wiggins, despite your uh, fake trade offers. And I think this gets them there, and it makes things a little easier down the road too. And they fight like finally just invest in in Kuminga and give him a chance. Dave, I'm gonna. I have one gripe with your trade. Uh oh. Uh, the Jazz are currently on a six game win streak, and as you mentioned earlier today, on their, their last nineteen. Yeah, yeah, they're crazy right now. So why would they want to trade for Wiggins? Someone okay. who doesn't look good right now. Maybe the future doesn't look that bright either. Like why trade so for John Collins? John Collins is 
is I think owed more money and uh, it's like, like longer contract, but also it's more about the positional fit. If, if they got Wiggins and it didn't work out, they probably flip him this summer. Not that big a deal. There's no role really for John Collins. If he's not hitting shots, not really defending Wiggins, I think is going to either. He's going to snap out of it. He's at least going to be a serviceable rotation guy for them by virtue of his position. Positional value for two-way wings is just through the roof. And even if they underperform expectations, which that really is what it is with Wiggins, he's not been good, but in particular compared to his previous standards. So I think if he could go out there and be passable, average starter on the wing for them, this is a huge upgrade. Nonetheless, just having a guy who can go out and guard two, three, and four uh, on your roster is a big deal, especially if they make it to the play-in and you might need them to go out there. Maybe they're playing the Lakers. He can go guard LeBron, you know, things like that. I think he's just a better fit for what they need. Collins is I, getting no run come come play in. I, I just think there's one thing we've ignored in this conversation. I could see my trade happening from the Cleveland perspective. I don't quite see it happening from the Utah perspective. I don't know why they would want to acquire that contract and and uh, bog down their cap sheet that far out into the future with this like young, fun, interesting team and take away the flexibility that they worked so hard for with the Mitchell and Gobert trades and all their draft picks and all that stuff. I, I just think that like, I don't know if they would do that unless it also came with probably like a first round pick attached. Yeah. And, at and you know, maybe to make it happen. I don't know about a first because it's John Collins, maybe two seconds. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe a fake first that becomes a second. Um, you know, it's funny. You can see all that, but you can't remember Carlos Pena. Carlos Pena. <laughs> he's forgettable right that's why they trade him. whoa okay all right i was okay i was gonna give mike the point originally just for the money ball reference but carlos pena is a legend absolute <laughs> legend i'm a tampa bay race fan and he is a tampa bay legend and so we will not disrespect you didn't him. remember his name you didn't remember his name until dave said it no no, no i knew i just didn't say it uh-huh uh-huh absolute legend dave gets the point <laughs> blasphemy blasphemy <laughs> You got to know your personnel. 2-1 heading into uh, <laughs> the, the final take. And the final person we will be fake trading today is UCLA legend. I, don't, I actually don't know if we consider him a legend. But Zach Levine. Dave, where do you want to send him to? Um, Unfortunately, I just don't think Zach Levine is a winning player. And I just don't think he's got much of a market. So you might as well send him somewhere that's fun. LaMelo Ball could use a running mate like Zach Levine, a guy who can take pressure off of, who can score, who can catch some lobs. You know, I mean, they they would look great together. Send him to Charlotte for Gordon Hayward, James Booknight. It's a throwaway on Booknight. You get Hayward for this push to the play-in that the Bulls are making behind Kobe White. You add a veteran, a guy who can handle the ball, he can defend, play the wing. I, I just think that this is a trade that's about getting Zach Levine out of Chicago allowing the Bulls to really focus on the future a little bit more. You know, and I think Charlotte would have to throw in some some sort of pick compensation, at least a pick, if not two. Uh, but Levine and LaMelo Ball is fascinating. You're not going to get any defense at all, but they will score. And as we've seen with the Indiana Pacers, if you can score night in, night out consistently, if this could be a top eight offense, you're going to win a couple time, games. Time, time, time. All right, Mike, you're up. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also kind of uh, sending Zach Levine off to Hoth a little bit, but yeah, I'm sending him to San Antonio, which is at least probably a little bit nicer, I think. It's time to get Victor Wembanyama some help. Like, he, the, the guy needs help, man. He needs somebody who can break down a defense. Uh, so I'm sending out Doug McDermott, Devontae Graham, Chetty Osman, send them out to Chicago, get some kind of pick situation going in there, I think probably a little bit. This alleviates the cap situation for Chicago in the immediate term, let them start their tear down, rebuild, whatever. San Antonio, <laughs> their their books are so clean, they can eat like two Zach Levine contracts and still be okay. And you know what? Like they need the help. That's the most important thing for them is the development of Victor Wembanyama right now. You get a guy who can score, who can open up the floor, who can create some spacing in that offense and help uh, Wembanyama and like he just needs it. And so I, I think, you worry about that first. You worry about the books later. And by the time Wim right. Yama is really good. By the time Victor Wim Yama is really good, he hasn't touched the basketball because he <laughs> plays with Zach Levine. Right? No, like, by the time he's really good, like you can trade him. You can enjoy watching Victor Wim Yama do stuff. For me, I say, look, 
you need to get an old school pass first point guard in there. Not Zach Levine, who has shown, I don't know that he can make a post entry pass. I don't know what his passing into pick and roll looks like. Zach Levine has never been that guy. This is why I would put him with LaMelo Ball so he doesn't have to be that guy. He doesn't have to focus on other people. He can just go out, get his. He will provide some spacing, but in the, the process of getting his buckets, that's what he does. High usage. He is not going to feed. Look, Victor Wimanyama already has an issue touching the basketball. Already. And he's playing with far worse players than Zach Levine. I think Zach Levine is, is fine. Uh, not maybe he's not a great player and might might not be a good player, but he's a better player than most of the guys in San Antonio right now. I'm going to give him that credit, but he also is a gunner. A 40% usage would not be out of the question for him. Could you imagine how many times Pop would have to yell at him? We would get some all-time theatrical television out of the interactions between those two guys. Listen, listen. First of all, you said it already. He's better than what the Spurs have right now. You know who can't throw an entry pass? Anyone on the Spurs, I've watched them try. It hasn't been pretty. Zach Levine doesn't throw, need to throw entry passes. He needs to throw lobs because he's breaking down the defense and Wemba Nyama gets open underneath the basket. All right. he They need someone to score the damn ball on the Spurs. You can figure it out. You can make Wemba Nyama uh, learn how to play alongside him. You can make Zach Levine learn how to play alongside Wemba Nyama. The contract... Who cares? By the time Wembenyama is in his fourth season, that's already an expiring deal. So you can move on from that. It's not It's not going to hurt you. And let me tell you something else about Olympic gold medalist Zach Levine, who has a history of winning under Greg Popovich. All right? Let's bring that back. Put that in San Antonio. That gold medal DNA. It's perfect for the Spurs. Like, we've seen it work before. Zach Levine plus Greg Popovich equal... I, I was going to say rings, but I think they got a medal. So like medals. I I was going to ask you that, Dave. I saw a clip today on Twitter, I think, of just like pop coaching. I don't know if you guys have seen that clip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I was wondering. I'm like, would, would like the assumption of who Zach Levine would be as a player, does that change under pop? Like, if I mean, it, it maybe does. I would just say that Team USA – Zach Levine is going to be different than San Antonio Spurs. Zach Levine, sure. that just plain and simple. His higher his his position in the hierarchy is just going to be completely different. He's nowhere close to the best player on Team USA. He'd be the second best player in in San Antonio. Um, second most important at a minimum, but second best because Victor is probably already better. So I, I just think that you, you know when we compare how guys do with national team, where it's only stars only peers and often you're not the best one especially in zach levine's case i i just don't think that you can translate that to to what it would be like on an individual team although i bet him and pop would get along great because i mean pop's never had a guy who can score like that i mean manu was probably the last one so i mean there's a lot a lot of positives there but i think the negative on court effect for victor women yama is worth not doing it for San Antonio, no matter how much more competent Zach Levine is than any of the yahoos that are out there right now. I mean, you ever watch a Spurs game? Yes. Okay. It is, it can be a hard watch, especially if you're like me and I'm really only watching for Victor. I just want, what's he going to do? Cause he does something every game and you're sometimes waiting for five, six possessions before he gets the ball in an advantageous position. I mean, it's just, it is incredibly frustrating. So I'm with you. I want him to have, a player of the caliber of Zach Levine. I don't want it to be Zach Levine. I, I mean, I think Dave's just being selfish because he wants to watch Trey Jones, Victor Wembanyama pick and roll for the rest of his life. Hey, you know, have wrong. you looked at Victor's uh, numbers since since Trey Jones entered the <laughs> starting lineup? He's become incredibly efficient uh, in, in those games. I mean, he, just having a competent ball handler who is willing to pass matters jeremy sohan i think he's going to wind up being a good player he was not thinking about passing <laughs> at any point in his tenure as a spurs point guard so uh just i mean anybody bork it could be you because you would be like you know i, I can't do this i gotta pass i gotta pass where's the tall guy like i think a good entry pass. so so like natural to me find the tall guy who's really good yeah but you so, know what here here's the thing here's the thing Think about the knock-on effects for Victor Wembanyama if you trade for Zach Levine. Blocks per game, go up. Rebounds, go up. 
Like, how's that not good for for Victor? For the NBA to see his stats climb rapidly in his first few years in the league. You, you want to sell Levine's a star, you need numbers. So bad. Victor Wimanyama could break the blocks record. Now, that's an angle for a player acquisition I've never heard before. You should be an agent, <laughs> Mike. We're here to change the game. We're here to change the game. Uh, I, I got one final question for you guys. Uh, neither one of you guys listed a current contender, at least. And so my question is, is Levine just not a good fit for any contender this year or this season? I mean, he makes $40 million, right? Yeah. Like that, that's where you got to start. He makes $40 million this season. And so, you you know, making the money work for a contender requires them to send out a good player. And how many good players are available in a Zach Levine trade? Not many, if any. So yeah. I think that that's what you run into. Like, I think Zach Levine is an NBA starter. Um, Zach Levine is not the third piece of your big three and $40 million is that kind of money. And so, yeah, none of the contenders, I mean, he, he would help a few teams. He would help the the Lakers for sure. And you could see where he could fit playing off the ball from LeBron James. You also wouldn't have to worry about any of the pecking order stuff because there's just no way you go into the Lakers and, you know, don't know what your role is. So he could theoretically help, but it's cost. You know, yeah. does Zach Levine make them a, a championship team? No. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, now you're going from talking about basketball to talking about like, you know, advanced accounting or whatever. I know. You just have to consider you're going 40 this year, 43, 46, 49 by the last year of his deal with a new second apron and like the, the, the new like difficult and very, very costly uh, CBA rules. It's just tough to trade for a guy who makes that much unless he definitively is your last piece or he's someone so good who's worth it. Zach Levine's not him. It's not, you know, it's not his fault. Like he's just a really good guy who rightfully took the money when he should have. Um, and then a new CBA came around and just made his contract painful. It's just, it, it kind of just is what it is. We're not, you know, it's just, now we get into nerd uh, CBA accounting instead of basketball stuff. I hate thinking about these guys as little contracts running around on the court, but that little contract can't throw a post entry pass. So I don't want to see him playing with Victor Whitman Yama. Now I'm watching. I'm imagining the, like, remember the, how a law, beco how Bill becomes yeah. a law from schoolhouse rock. I'm imagining I'm him trying to throw an entry good. pass. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give a lot of points actually right now. Um, first off, we're going to start off by giving both of you negative one for sending Zach Levine to hell. <laughs> we can we can't be doing that to ucla players and so you guys both get a negative one so the score is one to zero as of now um mike you get a point for sending him to a lesser hell in san antonio um so it's one to one and i'm gonna give one more point to mike for being the greatest agent of all time for making up that block that that, that block analysis that's crazy uh, that's crazy <laughs> My God. Unbelievable. What can, what can I say? Unbelievable. What can I say? That, I can't believe I can't believe LaMelo and Zach Levine is not cool enough to to potentially save the, the Charlotte Hornets franchise Dave, from like moving to Kansas City. Dave, you have to remember LaMelo was a UCLA commit and then he left. So we don't stand with LaMelo. We don't stand with LaMelo anymore. Wow, wow. Hating on a young entrepreneur. That that just is unbecoming of you, Sam. I mean, the guy just had to go out and get paid, you know? I mean, I it's not I like it, he man. had family in the NBA. Well, uh, that's uh, two straight wins for Mike versus Dave. And so this is unbelievable. Maybe you'll go for the three-peat next. Yeah, uh, yeah, just let me know anytime you want me to come on and win on your home court again. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, let us know in the comments uh, who was more correct. And it's never Dave because he only sends players to hell and it's kind of sad.